that that my studio is uh, Rob Bristow's place up on 272 next to Susan and Tom's house. Um, I know this is meant to be a studio tour. A lot of this work is in my studio, but I didn't take very good photographs of my studio, which I meant to do and I apologize. But if anybody is just driving by and you wanna peek in, there's plenty of windows and there's painting going on in there. So please feel free. Okay. Okay, the talk is it's called Painting as Environment, Learning to Appreciate the Weather. Okay, so this is a quote from a psychoanalyst, a British psychoanalyst named W.D. Winnicott. He, he writes, for according to my view, it is the most alarming thing to be an infant discovering the feelings that turn up when, when excitement comes along. Have you ever looked at it that way? And this is a poem by W.H. Auden called The More Loving One. Looking up at the stars, I know quite well that for all they care, I can go to hell. But on earth, indifference is the least we have to dread from man or beast. How should we like it for stars to burn with a passion for us we could not return? If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Admirer as I think I am of stars that do not give a damn. I cannot, now I see them say, I missed one terribly all day. Were all stars to disappear or die, I should learn to look at an empty sky and feel its total dark sublime, though this might take me a little time. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more. I'm just going to say that I would say that my practice as a painter is um, incomplete in a sense that I am myself trying to sort of turn off a sort of objective goal for myself. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm trying to find a voice rather than produce a voice. And so maybe as you're looking at all of these things, they're, they're from different times, they're, they're mostly chronological, but, um, these are all just different things that I've done over the time. And then, of course, this is Joan Mitchell. This is not me. Okay. Um, all right. So to acknowledge painting as environmental, contingent, outside, or as something encompassing, like the heavens or the season, is to defer to it as a condition of its own becoming. Much has been made of subjectivity in art. Many histories have been written about individual artists and their contribution to the humanities. But with this writing, I will attempt a reversal in which I emphasize the source of that creative energy or inspiration that leads us in one way or another to painting as located outside of subjectivity and rather in a relational space that exists between ourselves and our objects. Painting is a world of hard edges, atmosphere, mist, built up surfaces, moods, brushwork, colors, gestures, harmonies, clashes, color fields, smudges, illusion, geometry, grids, intimate spaces, dabs, scrapes, smears, zips, stains, spills, incidences, clots, vibrations, interference, rhythm, patterns, representations, shapes, drips, expressions, tensions, numbers, lines, divisions, layers, restraints, absences, exaltations, and so much more. Painting is a material world, and as a painter, we act within it and according to the vitality and vibrancy of these myriad effects, which are an array of active forces. For example, when the color red sits against the color green of the same value, the two will vibrate wildly. Or when paint is flung from a great distance, it will turn into something like a thread before it hits the surface like a spit or spider web. Graphite can be turned to dust and scattered with the breath or sharpened into a fine point. 
The painter navigates these conditions in the way a surfer rides a wave. Painting like the ocean is a fluid force, which has its own vitality and power. This situation between a painter and her materials is precarious and unpredictable, but it is exactly this excitement, this game, this romance that draws me to it. Who I want to be or what I imagine my art should look like is a complicated matter tied to the delicate problems of materiality. Embedded within painting's material is a tangle of effects and relationships that is largely outside my control and understanding. But rather than attempt to straighten things out or take control, I can choose instead to let myself get carried away by the force of the material complexity as environmental or encompassing. I can choose to acknowledge painting's effects as the condition for my inspiration and to appreciate them as the source of my creative excitement. Rather than assume I am meant to take charge of my materials and to have them do what I want them to do, I can subject myself to a far more relational situation, which ultimately will be less about my choosing and more about my response. For the painter Joan Mitchell, the outside world was something to let come crashing in. Unlike the painters championed by the prominent New York art critics, Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg, Mitchell was not afraid to let herself be carried away by influences outside of painting, including nature. Perhaps because so many of her friends were gay male poets cruising the world, or because she was a woman too familiar with the male painter's intent on winning, she chose to give herself over to painting in a passionate rather than analytical homage to color, paint, and the environment at large. Few other painters of the time, including Helen Frankenthaler, let themselves slip between nature and painting like Mitchell did. To do so was to risk femininity. In her phenomenal book, Women, the New York School and Other True Abstractions, Maggie Nelson writes about Mitchell's love affair with color, nature, and poetry, not as a reactionary discourse, but as a liberal and inexhaustible formal direction in painting with no deconstructed endgame. The following two quotations from Mitchell are borrowed from Nelson's book. In 1958, Mitchell told an interviewer, quote, I am very much influenced by nature as you define it. However, I do not necessarily distinguish it from man-made nature. A city, is a, strain, a city is as strange as a tree. In 1986, she tells an interviewer, quote, I was in the garden and the trees and the gardens were beautiful and there was a beautiful light and I saw the paintings moving a big strong man lifted and moved them with great ease. And I saw all their colors between the trees moving and it was like a parade and I was happy. Nelson writes that the anecdote indicates something of a deep pleasure to be found in the blurring of boundaries between art and nature, pigment and color, human and non-human, aesthete and naturalist and so on. Not to mention the profound gratification of evacuation of getting rid of one's art and of watching it join the procession of objects in the world as Warhol celebrated with his floating silver pillows. The Oxford, Oxford English Dictionary gives this broad definition of environment. The physical surroundings or conditions in which a person or other organisms live, develops, etc., or in which things exist. The external conditions in general affecting the life, existence, or property of an organism or object. For Mitchell, the environment was not only the light and trees, but also classical music, which she played loudly in her studio. The rhythms of the city and the poetry of the New York School poets, such as her friends John Ashbery, James Schuyler, and Frank O'Hara, Mitchell would work on multiple large panels independently of one another in her studio. Um, her studio was only large enough to work on two or three at a time, so a lot of shuffling happened. After the paintings were finished, she would place them into a final arrangement. She thought of these independent panels as stanzas and the relationships, rhymes, and rhythms between them as poetics. 
Although Frankenthaler was dismissive of any su suggestion of or of depiction of landscape in her work, even if we take her at her word, it is hard not to look at those famous photographs of her seated inside a cascade of color stained canvas and to see her project as any less encompassing than Mitchell's. It is hard not to see the two women's practice as deeply connected. What is paradoxical about an environment is that it is comprised of the individual objects or organisms that develop within it. No object, however foreign seeming, is alien to the condition in which it survives. Everything within an environment is both different and connected. A painting exists within the field of painting, and it is in this dense field, which is both vital and a condition of the vitality of painting. Sorry, a painting exists within this field, and it is this dense field which is both vital and a condition of the vitality of painting. As makers of painting, we might not feel connected to our environment, but how we feel and the fact of our connectedness are two different things. Everyone who paints is connected to everyone else who paints. We are all part of something inexplicably large. I was traveling from Southern Utah recently and saw what I interpreted as paintings in the rocks of the canyon walls. And this was quite a thrill. Over millions of years, water eroded the surface of the earth in these parts and it left giant networks of canyons with tall, steep, exposed rocks. And the layers of earth were formed at different times so the chemical makeup of the layers appeared as different colors, reds, whites, and purples mostly. Often it would appear that one color was dripping down into another and very real, real pictures appeared where the white and red rocks mixed. As I passed through hundreds of miles of labyrinthine, labyrinthine canyons, these giant gestural paintings spoke to me. I once went to see Joan Jett in concert and afterwards I confided to a friend that throughout the show I had felt Joan Jett gazing right at me, but my friend had felt the same way. So we asked other people and they confirmed that they had also felt Joan's eyes fixed on them. I wonder how many humans have passed through these deep spiritual canyons, which look like ancient ruins and architecture and felt these walls were communicating. Once when I was very young, maybe eight years old, my mom took me to the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco and I remember telling my mom that I felt I knew why these paintings were there. I don't know what I meant, except perhaps I felt a sense of belonging. In Utah, I became convinced that these paintings and ones like them around the world were the source of what inspired people to paint at all. The paintings connected me to feelings I don't often have. I could empathize with why people created gods, language, and art, because these large inexplicable forms conveyed a sense of wisdom and connection. Painters must paint within the field of painting, but how do we navigate this field? What is it that we want or need from painting? Capitalism would have us believe that we are separate from one another, our environment and even ourselves, and that we must control things in order to survive. I believe this problem is a problem of aesthetics and that it concerns what we find beautiful, meaningful, clean, or ugly. In permaculture farming, the first rule is to observe and not to analyze or draw conclusions. A person interested in permaculture first spends years observing their environment before making decisions about what to grow. Learning about what to grow, learning what grows well naturally instead of creating a tenuous situation in conflict with the forces already at play. The second rule of permaculture is that you should kill your lawn. Lawns are seen as clean, weeds as ugly. But in permaculture, nature is messy and negative feelings may arise as you learn to adjust. The same is true of painting. The funkiness, smelliness, banality, or weight of paint can seem ugly, empty, cold, aggressive, or overwhelming. But if we subject ourselves like dutiful students to the raw material of paint, it will show us something unexpected. When I walk into a museum and stand in front of a work of art, what is my motivation? And why am I myself compelled to make paintings? According to Sylvan Tompkins, a psychologist who invented the field of affect theory, affects, or very simply our emotions, 
are what motivate us and give our lives a sense of urgency. Tompkins' theory about emotions was, was a subtle and important departure from how motivation was thought about by Sigmund Freud, whose beliefs about what he called our drives have generally taken hold in modern culture. For Freud, there are two basic drives, towards life or eros, towards healthy relationships, reproduction, and hard work, and conversely towards destruction, aggression, or what is called the death drive. Freud's goal was to alleviate suffering by making us aware of unconscious tendencies to recreate tra traumatic events from childhood and instead to reconnect us to eros or the life drive. Tompkins theory of affect proposes instead that it is our feelings and not our drives that motivate and give our lives meaning. He wrote, any affect may have any object. This is the basic source of complexity of human motivation and behavior. In her introduction to the Sylvan Tompkins reader, Yves Kosofsky Sedgwick writes, Tompkins comes to seem the psychologist one would most like to read with Proust. He more than supports the Proustian fascination with taxonomies of persons and the Proustian certainty that the highest interest of such taxonomies is in ever making grounds for disconfirmation and surprise. I am fascinated by what Sedgwick means by making grounds for disconfirmation and surprise. I love this word disconfirmation because it reverses what we think we want, which is confirmation. In affect theory, Tompkins says that surprise is the only affect which is neutral. Sedgwick spent the last years of her life working on a book about Proust. About this project, she writes, for a few years now, I've been working on a book on Proust. Now working on a book on Proust is a wonderful place in which to spend some years. If I'm going to be overly confident, sorry, if I'm going to be over, overly confiding, as apparently I am, I've placed a lot of trust in Proust's well-known antidepressant effect, especially nowadays in a global situation where dread paralysis and a newly intimate shame of citizenship seems to exert so much of the opposite pressure. What does Tompkins mean when he says that surprise is the only neutral affect? A feeling of surprise is like an emotional palate cleanser, and in Proust, our main character, like a good permaculturalist, goes about Combray vividly describing his experience of things and feelings without analysis or judgment. Nothing confirms a hunch or an idea. Combray feels like the world after a rain, fresh and new, and I'm inclined to compare this to the concept of beginner's mind in Buddhism. What excites me about Tompkins' theory that we are motivated by our feelings rather than our drives is that it makes doing something like painting quite sensible. Who has not asked themselves what the purpose, what purpose art serves? But in a world where we privilege our emotions as an organizing principle of our lives, painting seems functional. When I walk into a museum or attempt to make a painting, I am motivated by a need for creativity, purpose, love, connection, empathy, respect, all the things that I don't get from capitalism and competition. When I enter into the museum, I have not come for the news or statistics, but for the pleasure of appreciation. William Carlos Williams wrote, it is difficult to get the news from poetry, but men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. The arts is the place to learn appreciation rather than understanding. And the distinction is an important one. To understand means to grasp, hold, or possess knowledge, but to appreciate is something different. When we enter into a museum, we come prepared to recognize or to acknowledge. And when we leave, we may take a postcard with us to remember the experience of looking at a particular painting. I come to recognize myself in others others who perhaps lived in a different time and place. If I stand in front of a painting, there will be a space between myself and it. This space is a medium distance, not so far away that I feel remote or alien and not so close that I do damage or harm. When I take the time to stand at this medium distance from a painting, I subject myself to it. I let it affect me. I do not acquire or possess the work, but rather I form an appreciation by letting its material qualities excite feelings in me. I don't attempt to understand mechanically or epistemologically this transference or to break the object down in it, into its functional parts. 
but rather to let the object meet my needs or to satisfy some feeling. I accept it without needing it to be resolved or confirmed. Perhaps I need to cry or to feel inspiration or to feel happy or playful. And so I let the object bring forth these feelings in me. I witness these objects in order to be affected by them. I come with the need to let my affects be excited, which is better described passively as appreciation than actively as understanding. I come to give myself, I come to give something of myself my admiration, and my willingness to be transformed and opened up. And I do this by letting the objects agitate and organize my feelings into, in new and pleasurable ways. Even when I visit a familiar painting, I experience a slightly different feeling from the time before. And in this, in, in this way, I experience the object as new. And it is not the object that has changed me. It is me, and so the object reminds me how much is contingent, incoherent, and relational in me. Interest and excitement for Tompkins are positive affects, but again, because any object can have any affect, the same painting that feels shameful one day can seem beautiful and pleasurable the next. It is not our job as painters to figure out our feelings and to consistently express the same thing over and over again. Rather, our paintings will excite different affects in us, and often it will be alarming when these feelings come along. But we must first learn to appreciate the weather, and we cannot control it. If we can appreciate art as transformational, then we can allow it to show itself in us. In my experience, a painting that appears bright and happy can cause depressed and feeble feelings, or a painting that seems tumultuous or melancholy can make me feel warm because I feel safe to feel as I do rather than optimistically or conventionally opposed to my own complicated needs. Aesthetics are coercive when they prevent us from taking care that our work is caring for us and those around us. Art appreciation is also referred to as a love of art. And these terms, appreciation and love, open my attention to the type of relationship that exists between myself and painting. As a painter, I lose myself in external objects, like I might lose myself in a lover or a friend. Lauren Berlant wrote in an interview, love is one of the few places that people want to become different. The thing I like about love as a concept for the possibility of the social is that love always means non-sovereignty. Love is always about violating our own attachment to your own intentionality without being anti-intentional. I like that love is greedy, you want incommensurate things and you want them now. And the now part is important. If, as Berlant writes, that love is where we want to become different, the affair between art and humans is no exception. Intentions preclude the attention to surprise and discomfort that our materials will insist on. Intentions like are like demands, but space and appreciation will be reciprocated. Intentions distract from discovering the nature of things as they are. Your materials will express what is alive in them and force them, and to force them to be otherwise will not get you what you want. On the other hand, to be anti-intentional is to abandon or neglect your objects. So like with a lover, you must be both receptive and present, and this combination is not always easy to strike. However, relationships only produce meaningful synchronicities when both parts find a way to interact and respect to the other, with respect to the other. Berlant also points out that love is greedy and immediate. And again, a painter knows all too well how badly you can want something and how what you want is probably incommensurate. But again, I believe that painting trains us to appreciate our in incommensurate needs as something appealing and of delicate value. Love like painting and literature is not an affect, but rather an environment that structures and holds our sense of being. What does Berlant mean when she suggests that love is a place where people want to become different? What does she mean by different? When I ask myself what it means to be different, I remember what it is like to enter into the space of the museum. Before I walk through the doors or while I am still in the lobby, I am muddle-headed or anxious or just a little unclear. My emotions are dull and confused 
I am abuzz with all kinds of feelings that I cannot translate. But as soon as I have stood in front of a few works of art, the chords of my soul are plucked into a harmony and the world rings out in a way that binds me to it. I stand at a particular distance from the painting, not so distant as to become alienated or to experience shame and not so close as to crowd or damage it. My, my appreciation for a work of art happens within a certain proximity and also at a certain distance. Within this medium range, I subject myself to something outside of me. I let painting organize my affects, and this change in me is what it means to be different. What is paradoxical about what it means to be different is that it means to give over to that which is outside of you and to become non-separate or non-sovereign from your environment. Judith Butler writes, in her book, Giving an Account of Oneself. Sorry, for Butler in her book, Giving an Account of Oneself, she proposes that oneself represents a secret or a partial opacity that is only made accessible in relationship to others. But for Butler, it is precisely this problem of giving an account of oneself that binds us socially and ethically to one another. She writes, there is, there is that in me and of me for which I can give no account. But does this mean that I am not, in the moral sense, accountable for who I am and for what I do? If I find that despite my best efforts, a certain opacity persists and I cannot make myself fully accountable to you, is this ethical failure? Or is it a failure that gives rise to another ethical disposition in the place of a full and satisfying notion of narrative accountability? Is there in this affirmation of partial transparency a possibility for acknowledging a relationality that binds me more deeply to language and to you than I previously knew? So that was kind of complicated, but I think what she's saying is just that we have a hard time understanding each other and that through language and art, we kind of can bridge those opacities, that language uh, is what binds us, art is what binds us. We come to paint as a way of knowing ourselves differently in accordance with that which is outside of us. A love of painting is a condition or an environment that surrounds us with a sense of connection and appreciation for the other. It is a way of looking past ourselves and of transforming our perceptions. I love going to the Art Institute of Chicago to look at rooms of paintings by Claude Monet. I would call this a guilty pleasure, but as I get older, my love of Impressionism increases and my concerns about its cliches dwindle. The first time I remember falling in love with Monet was at the Clark in Williamstown, Massachusetts. The painter Monica Bear had invited me to Williamstown to see her show at the college, and we were there with her then partner, the art historian Hilma Draxler and the painter Ulrika Muller. The group of us went to the Clark to look at paintings together. The whole group of us would stand in front of a single painting and talk about it at length. As the youngest and least knowledgeable of this incredible group, I am not sure I added much to these conversations. But as these brilliant people verbalized their admiration for these works of art, they opened a world to me. I learned of a deeper kind of love and appreciation for painting than I knew was possible. The love of painting is not always self-evident. It requires learning from others and opening oneself to error. I cannot account. I cannot count how many times I was dismissive of something that I later found irresistibly wonderful. This is true of Monet. It was at the Clark I first saw one of his Rouen cathedral paintings and fell in love with it. There was a time when someone would mention Monet and I would find myself resisting sunsets and water lilies. But when I saw the Rouen cathedral painting, something clicked. The surface of the painting is built up with tiny daubs of color and I could appreciate Monet's project as a dedication to light and not to the objects he represented. Clearly Monet's interest in water was his interest in color and light in any object that would hold the light like a haystack or the facade of the Rouen Cathedral. Each day he carried his tools outside not to paint the water or the cathedral, but to see if he could make oil paint appear to slip into a world of shimmer. Now whenever I go to, to Chicago, I make a point of visiting Monet as I do a very dear friend. Roland Barthes writes, difference, that much vaunted and insistent word 
prevails because it dispenses with or triumphs over conflict. Conflict is sexual, semantic. Difference is plural, sensual, and textual. Meaning and sex are principles of confusion, sorry, of construction, of constitution. Difference is the very movement of, of dispersion, a friability, a shimmer. That what matters is not the discovery in a reading of the world and of the self, of certain oppositions, but of encroachments, overflows, leaks, skids, shifts, slips. I want to turn to another concept of the environmental in the work of W.D. Winnicott, a British psychoanalysis who was a contemporary of Melanie Klein and a student of Freud's. Both Klein and Winnicott worked extensively with mothers and their infants. What Winnicott termed the facilitating environment referred to the space between the mother and her child, which facilitates the growth of the child. Much of Winnicott's writing is directed towards young mothers in the form of advice. He writes, now I want to make just one thing clear, it is this. Your baby does not depend on you for growth and development. Each baby is a going concern, and each baby is a vital spark, and this urge towards life and growth and development is a part of the baby, something the child is born with and in which is carried forward in a way that we do not have to understand. For instance, if you have just put a bulb in the window box, you know perfectly well that you do not have to make the bulb grow into a daffodil. You supply the right kind of earth or fiber and you keep the bulb water just the right amount and the rest comes naturally because the bulb has life in it. Now the care of infants is very much more complicated than the care of daffodil bulb, but the illustration serves my purpose because both the bulb, because both with the bulb and with the infant, there is something going on which is not your responsibility. The baby was conceived in you and from that moment became a lodger in your body. After birth, the baby became a lodger in your arms. This is a temporary affair. It will not last forever. In fact, it will not last for long. The baby will, will only too soon be at school. Just at the moment, this lodger is tiny and was in your body and needing the special care that comes from your love. This does not alter the fact that the tendency towards life and growth is something inherent to the baby. For Winnicott, the environment between the parent and the child was one of intuition and quiet. The baby experiences surprising feelings and has no language with which to communicate her needs. The parent responds intuitively and between them a secret language nonverbal language develops. Writing on Winnicott, Christopher Bolas proposed that our need for this kind of facilitating environment never goes away. Our feeling and need will always come up and in, in adult life we continue to seek out environments that will support our emotional life. Bolas applies new terminology to the facilitating environment writing on Winnicott. He refers to, to the parent and the child-parent relationship as a transformational object. The parent is a transformational object because they transform the environment of the child. Bolas suggests that we seek out relationships with other objects even into adulthood who will do the job of transforming our environment. I am a tall masculine woman. I grew up in Northern California with the privileges of lots of open space, the beach, cars, and nice food. However, there were no books in my house and conversation was limited. Ideas about the world did not come up, but my father was a builder and in the garage was a wood shop where he kept all of his tools. My father worked in San Francisco and my mother worked part-time for the Security Pacific Bank, Bank as a real estate appraiser. Each day of the week, my dad drove into San Francisco to his work as a general contractor. When I was younger than eight, he drove a white Ford Ranger pickup truck with the company logo on the door. He wore dirty jeans and a tool belt. But one day he got a promotion to protect to project manager and he no longer drove the truck or wore work clothes. Instead of a tool belt, he carried a briefcase and rolled up blue construction plans. My maternal grandfather was a Ford car salesman. And for this reason, my dad took pride, a lot of pride in his Ford's, 
Ford cars, but come to think of it, my mom drove a Volvo. Then one day he got another promotion to vice president of his company. And at this time he came home in an emerald green Mercedes. And I can hardly remember a day that my mom was more happy and loving towards him. I remember that it was sunny out and that he got a card in a balloon from someone as a congratulations. After his new promotion, he only wore suits and ties to work, which my mom bought from Macy's. As VP, he was responsible for bidding on jobs. And once his company flew him and my mom to Amsterdam to bid on a job to work with the architect Rem Koolhaas on a new Prada store in LA. This is the only time I can remember my parents flying anywhere together. And my dad came home with a contract with Koolhaas. He likes to tell the story of the day he met with Koolhaas and the other builders bidding on the job. He says everyone was asked about the new building materials. And my dad said he was excited about plastics. And Rem loved this answer and, got, and it got him the job. In the years since my dad worked on the Prada store in LA, my parents divorced and he started wearing Prada clothes and driving a Porsche. The tiny, the tight, shiny red shirts, black pants and long pointy leather shoes looked silly and out of place on him. But I also see that it was his fondness for new things and materials that expressed in him who he was. I traveled to Amsterdam from Berlin in my early 20s for a queer festival and I did not think about my mother or father or their, or their earlier trip. But some years later, my father visited me in Berlin. We got caught in the rain outside in the Neue National Gallery, right, at, right, right outside the Neue National Gallery. And by some cosmic coincidence, there was an exhibition of Rem Koolhaas's work on view. My father, whom, I, to, to, whom to my knowledge had never before visited a museum, found within the exhibition a model made of plastic he himself had put together for the Prada store. One of my dad's favorite bits of advice is to stick to your knitting. He says this often and once said it to my girlfriend who is now my wife. She looked at him a little taken aback and said, well, I don't knit. It has never occurred to me how feminine and demure it sounded. But I think about my father's shapely body in the long narrow Prada shoes and red blousey shirts and how I have enjoyed and taken pleasure in his openness towards life. And I wonder about my own masculinity in relationship to his. I have a workshop at home now and he has given me a lot of the beautiful tools in it. To appreciate art as transformational is to allow it to show itself in us. It is a medium that alters the self. It is environmental contingent, outside, or something encompassing, like the heavens or the season. And the certainty that the highest interest in description and observation in this is in ever making grounds for disconfirmation and surprise. I've talked about relation and love and difference. Difference is like texture. It is the pleasure of plurality. And it is through difference that we feel the relationality that binds us to language, art, and each other. And through love that we locate the patience and security to appreciate the weather. That was wonderful. Let me um, start my video. Thank you so much, Fox, for that really heartfelt analysis of an artist's relationship to art. I mean, it, it was very emotional for me to listen to that. I've studied art. I, I am an art historian. I went to graduate school and studied art, loved the abstract expressionists. You mentioned um, Joan Mitchell and Frankenthaler. I saw Franz Klein in what I think was one of your works. Um, yeah. Mark Rothko, also um, hugely emotional artist. Um, I, I just, I don't mean this to be about me at all, but I just- No, please, I'm-, I'm... The, um, Years ago, I was asked by the art historian Vincent Scully to compare um, a Clifford Still with a Frederick Church. Now this is a hundred year difference between abstract expressionists and um, 
Hudson River School artist talking about the emotional content though, it, there was such a strong relationship between the two. And um, I just wonder if you have any, you, you mentioned your love of Monet and Impressionists and do you have um, favorite abstract expressionist artists other than the ones that you mentioned? That's a good question. Um... You know, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, I always loved that Agnes Martin called herself an abstract expressionist. You know, everybody else wanted to call her a minimalist, but she she was like, no, 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 my work's like, it's off the charts, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's like you always go through phases with these things. Yeah, who's my favorite abstract expressionist of the moment? I don't know. I mean, they're, they're so different in some yeah. ways that mm -hmm. I can see it would depend on. Um, you know, the thing I, I think the thing that I feel that interests me about abstract expressionism, which there's a lot of abstract expressionism in my own work because I'm a very gestural painter. You know, I, I think about, especially women painters who came after the sort of masculine heroicism of the New York school and I think about how they managed to insert themselves into that narrative. Like that complicated process of sort of having to just, you know, show up, show up to the party uninvited, so to speak, and like have a raging great time. It's like, it's a tall order, you know, you have to be very confident. So there's a kind of like, there, I, I talk a lot about confidence and doubt, like the relationship between confidence and doubt. And it's sort of like, you're like, am I really going to do this? And then you kind of just have to do it and you, then you, you doubt it. But then there's this kind of funny thing with, with painting that there it is, you know, there you are. You're at the party or you're not. And so you sort of have to make big giant gestures and sort of see how it goes. Um. Who's your favorite ab abstract expressionist? I love Mark Rothko. I just yeah. feel like I can sink into his work and go so many different places. And yet it's a very, you know, um, I mean, it's so deep. It just, you sort of can, you know, get absorbed by it. That, that's what I, I love that. So um, anyway, I um, just, Anyone else have comments they would like to make? Or um, I know we have a, a couple of artists in, um, in attendance this evening. Everybody's quiet. Um, it was just a terrific, terrific talk, Molly. I'm so impressed. You had said that you're not a writer but I would like to tell you that you are a writer. Thank you. I, I think I got a little nervous there at the end. I felt like I was going on and on. So I should have, I tried to, <laughs> I had my own, my own doubt, doubts come. So I'm, I'm glad that you were moved by it. That's. Oh yeah. Sure. Thank you. It was, it was beautifully written really. So. Thank you. So Fox, this is Kelly. Molly wants to ask a question about space. Okay. Molly. So if, Molly, if you want to unmute. I can just unmute. Okay. Um, then I'm going to mute. Hold on. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, are you muted? No, we I'm can hear you. Room, so. But are you muted? Yeah, weird. Oh, 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 I know, I know. Hold on. Okay, now. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, it's a hard question to figure out how to phrase, but the talk was so much about environment. And there's... So I'm thinking about, I mean, I think about your work in terms of space or place all the time. And um, I was just listening to you teach last night and thinking you were telling your students again and again to, um, to make the painting so that somebody could walk into it. This is the language you kept using. I wanna be able to walk around in it. You can walk around in a room. How can I walk around inside your painting? And I think your painting does this so well and so interestingly. And I think there's something about the way you wrote about environment. And I guess it like, to me, it has something to do with this question of like, of gesture of, of who you are, right? I mean, something I've known your paintings for six years now, 
but I feel like I'm getting a better and better sense of a person, a subject in them. I'm getting a better and better sense of a kind of figure in a ground. But, but I wonder if you would talk about that, about like when you're, when you're writing about environment and then you're telling students, I need to be able to walk around in this, there's this kind of metaphor and then there's this like really tangible idea about space. And I wonder if you could just sort of speak to, to that. Was that too vague? I think you have to press mute on your... I did, am I good? You try? Oh, okay. Um, I've been, what that makes me think about is our relationship to image and that the difference between an image and an environment is like an image you see and then it's gone, right? But an environment, if you go into an environment, it takes you a little time to walk around to figure out that place. Each year we know in Norfolk like that some years are good years for the garden and some years are not good years for the garden. So you can't just say simply, here is a garden in Norfolk every year that that garden, every year that garden will be different. Every year, you know, our nasturtiums either do well or they don't do very well. Our first year they went very well, since then not so well. And this is only to say that I find that my students' relationship to painting these days is very much as image. They make a painting, but they're not really that interested in it as a world, as a surface, as a built up surface. I don't really wanna go up to the surface of the painting and stay there because what they're intending is to make a picture that they, they take a photograph of and then post on Instagram. And it makes the object of the painting totally uninteresting to stay with. You don't wanna revisit it like you would a place. You don't wanna to get to know it over time. And I think for myself, you know, I mean, I always tell the story, which is true. Like I had a lot of very early commercial success and since then, I have been in an identity crisis. I didn't, I didn't go along with it. And then as a painter, I've stayed in an identity crisis for, you know, 20 years or something. But in this weird way, this crisis has allowed me a lot of time to learn and grow and change and, and be confused and get turned around and be lost for a long time. I haven't had to reproduce. I haven't had to become an image of myself. And so I think when there's like a sort of double thing, it's like you can teach a student how to make a good picture or you can sort of like get them to sort of stay in a space. And I think that good paintings, you do want to stay in them. I'm always showing them pictures of old landscapes, you know, because you don't just look at a picture of an old landscape and, you know, go like next. It's like, actually, there's like a little tiny guy way back there or, you know, you can really sort of like, see how the light is hard. It's a hard thing to, 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 to paint light, you know? It's, it's different just to paint a tree than it is to sort of like paint like the gloaming. Um, so I think of space as very important to teaching painting. I talk about it all the time with students. Yeah. Fox, this is Kelly. I have a question. Yeah. What do you like most about teaching? Ooh, <laughs> it's good you ask because <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I can complain a lot about it. But um, I do like being able to, I think I like, dis despite where the house I grew up in, you wouldn't know it by my mom and my dad. Really love words. You know, like I didn't have any books. Nobody read to me. There was nothing going on in terms of words. So I don't know why, but I really love words. You know, I'm Molly's amazingly like, you know, I can't spell anything. I'm like totally dumb. I couldn't like, don't have me edit your paper, you know, but I do really like being able to describe things. I love it. I think I'm good at it. I'm not the kind of teacher that will tell you, oh, that's, you're doing a really good job with that. I mean, I might say something like that, but if I'm saying something like that, 
I know why and I can describe what it is. So I really love being able to describe and articulate other people's gestures and marks. I'm, I like to do it for myself. It, 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 it's, and, and the other reason I like teaching actually very much is because like, you know, I'm teaching at RISD, which is like in the graduate department. I don't have any career. So like, how do I get a job at RISD in the painting department? I think I'm becoming a painter's painter. I'm allowed to do whatever I want with painting and I get paid for working in the painting world, but without having to deal with the gallery at all, <laughs> which maybe seems disingenuous, but you haven't been in the art world then because it's a really not very nice place to be. People talk about money all the time. Who wants to do that? I wanna talk about art. So there's advantages to teaching. Well, I think it's clear that you're a wonderful teacher. I mean, just from what we just listened to for 30 minutes, I would want, be one of your students any day if I was- Oh, thank you, Anne. I'm not an artist. All right, maybe I am an artist. Yeah, well, yeah. we're gonna try to start we're some, we wanna, we wanna do workshops and classes through the residency eventually. Okay. We'll apply for some funding to do things like that. And I don't know, teach like really serious painting classes. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Feel free to unmute and ask the question if you have one. Well, I think we're probably, we should let um, Fox and Molly have a wonderful evening in Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, safe travels to your very different destinations, back to Norfolk, on to, was it Milwaukee? No, Michigan. Uh, no. Madison, Madison. Madison, Madison, yeah. So, um, and thank you so much for taking the time on your journey to um, share with us this wonderful, wonderful um, talk that you just gave. Thanks so much. Thanks, yeah. you guys. Thanks, thank, for thank, thanks, everybody, for attending. Right. Thanks. Bye. Later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.